Okay. Or are you gonna do uh, standard? Should, should I put this in, in front of us so we can see? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to move that box up? Sure. Let's get <laughs> close. Up. Let's get more cozy in here. Let's go. <laughs> Okay, um, thanks everyone. Uh, I'm Laura, I'm here with Sam and Toby as part of Other Internet, which is a research organization that um, for the last few years has been uh, studying the uh, social, economic, political, and psychological implications of technology and exploring the pro-social applications of uh, uh, new media technologies. So, um, this is the title of our talk. We are here to talk about the nature of the protocol. And just to give some context, uh, for the last uh, four years, uh, since 2019, the three of us have been meeting every week uh, regularly to um, research and investigate uh, new cultural and institutional dynamics and primitives uh, in crypto and more broadly, uh, novel dynamics that we see emerging in uh, uh, digital environments. And so we explore the brands as consensus mechanisms with headless brands. Uh, we've looked at uh, novel challenges for protocols uh, uh, into finding uh, product market fit, uh, particularly with the uh, base layer protocols with market protocol fit. Uh, uh, we've uh, investigated uh, uh, novel group dynamics uh, emerging online with Squad Wealth, uh, and more recently we've been uh, uh, exploring the question or the um, yeah the question of public goods uh, uh, with the uh, um, positive some words or like the creation of positive protocol externalities, and at the same time we've also been involved with uh, um, a lot of different projects and organizations uh, um, aiming to improve uh, governance. Uh, accountability and looking at public goods. Uh, we've been working with uh, uh, Uniswap, uh, facilitating and uh, doing intervention in their governance. Uh, we've worked uh, with uh, uh, Optimism, uh, retroactive public good funding, and also we uh, developed our own toy model of what a public good for cultural institutions might look like uh, with artists Hito Steyer, um, with the Bundeskunsthalle in Bonn. And now for the last year, we've been uh, exploring even more deeply uh, the institutional affordances of crypto protocols. And so asking, what is a protocol institution? And so in order to answer what kinds of institutions uh, are crypto protocols, uh, we've looked at uh, a lot of very different models and theories. Uh, we've also explored a little bit of like pirates, uh, institutions that we might not get the time to get into today, but just to offer a little bit of context uh, or like a prehistory uh, to contextualize what will come next, uh, we've noticed that, um, you know, as you all know, Bitcoin introduced the idea of like a censorship resistance infrastructure that created a, a expectation perhaps of like law resistance. So the idea of being able to create uh, uh, stateless money, um, stateless uh, financial institutions, uh, organizations that can exist outside in specific jurisdiction. But then we've also observed that, that in the last few years, uh, we've seen a bit of an inversion of this narrative, uh, where we once uh, used to talk about, uh, again, stateless uh, money, now we hear of uh, uh, different kinds of crypto states. Uh, we talk about citizens, uh, we talk about public funding, um, democratic uh, uh, voting models. Uh, and so it seems that um, crypto has moved from wanting to create uh, institutions and organizations that can exist uh, outside of the state to wanting to replace uh, state institutions. But it seems to us, uh, uh, particularly with the work that we've done in uh, you know, looking at accountability in crypto protocols and DAOs, uh, um, it seems to us that protocols uh, cannot directly replace uh, types of uh, state-based institutions one-to-one. -one. And so our question is that how do protocols regulate behavior differently than uh, the law of the state. And one of the several models uh, that we've looked at uh, is uh, Lawrence Lessig's uh, uh, pathetic dot theory from the New Chicago School from 1990. And so uh, Lawrence Lessig uh, um, 
shows how the current regulatory regime, um, the law of the state definitely plays a key role, but it's not the only regulatory force. So um, the, we also have like uh, norms, uh, we have architecture, the built environment, uh, and also software, and we have markets. Uh, uh, but obviously the law has been able uh, to regulate or has a bit of a totalizing effect uh, in, this other, uh, in, in regulating these other forces so that we're all familiar with the public health campaign that have happened during the pandemic that created a, um, you know, a set of normative standards around, for instance, wearing masks, uh, uh, but also uh, you know, uh, we see how, uh, for instance, putting speed bumps uh, on a road uh, uh, very practically and physically orients and limits uh, the movement in, in space, and also how code uh, as a type of uh, digital architecture uh, similarly orients behavior, for instance, with like GDPR uh, type of compliance, uh, and also how the law is able to regulate markets in different ways, uh, uh, for instance, uh, in Berlin uh, putting a cap on rents uh, so that uh, the real estate market doesn't keep like spiraling out. Um, but we also see that crypto, um, these regulatory forces operate uh, in a different way. Yeah, so the um, uh, interesting thing about crypto is, um, as we know, it is based on the principles of censorship resistance, and that means that the law is unable to operate through it. Uh, protocols are sorts of um, organizations that don't have a legal charter, uh, and um, without the law being able to m operate through them in the same way that it is able to regulate these other, uh, regulate bodies and people through these other forces, um, we're left with three, these three remaining uh, forces, markets, architecture or code, and norms. Um, that all operate uh, in a little less coherent of a fashion. Um, so markets, obviously, you know, crypto protocols are also like market protocols. Um, they instantiate a market framework. And so the architecture and code are very closely tied. Um, and there are also a lot of like nascent norms in the space. This is uh, a theme you'll see, we'll, we'll talk about a bit later, but it's kind of undeveloped. You have lots of different um, cultural factions in, engaging in crypto. There's, uh, you know, everyone from uh, effective altruists to like privacy maxis and like anonymous memesters to, um, uh, you know, the most uh, cooperativistic and um, uh, kind of collectivist uh, factions as well. Um, so that uh, being the case, um, ah, Oh no, next one. That being the case, um, we have what we are kind of thinking of as a three-body regulatory problem, uh, where without the law being able to kind of align and cohere these other forces together into a, a coherent regime, um, there is a little bit more uh, conflict between these, um, between these three forces. Uh, you know, another, another aspect of, of the law is that it can it can take normative behaviors, don't cheat, don't steal, and attach punishment to them. Um, w now, without that, uh, in, in crypto, we have a really different regulatory uh, capacities. Um, so let's look at a few examples of the sorts of institutions that result when uh, the law is sub subtracted and uh, our, our pathetic dot, our confused little individual, is not able to... Um, or is, is uh, kind of subject to a different regulatory regime. Um, so we're going to look at two case studies, ENS and Curve. Um, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with both. Um, ENS is the you know, domain name registry of the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, they have a few different apparati in their um, protocol body. They have a, a foundation entity. They have a labs entity. They have token voting using Governor Bravo model. They um, have a, a constitution that's uh, very lightweight, um, and uh, they they charge fees on on uh, domain name registries going into a protocol or going into a protocol treasury. Um, now, uh, maybe ancient history at this point, but some of you perhaps remember what went down with Brantley Milligan, um, one of the co-founders and the director of the ENS Foundation. Um, 
you know, some uh, transphobic and homophobic tweets of his from 2016 resurfaced, and there was a big public outcry among ENS holders who felt that there would, uh, that uh, th those kinds of norms like didn't belong in the, the kind of public utility um, community that is the building ENS. Um, and what this resulted in was basically a de facto cancellation campaign that culminated in a vote to remove him as director of the ENS Foundation, um, which is something that is chartered in, in the, the ENS Foundation charter that they, somebody could be removed from a vote. But the issue was that um, although the community expected uh, Brantley to abstain, um, as would normally be expected of somebody who uh, is, is like the subject of, of such a vote, um, Brantley did not abstain. It wasn't actually baked into the protocol that somebody could be removed um, or, or a, a vote concerning a person like would require them to abstain. So instead, um, he, his votes were actually able to swing the vote and he remained as, as director of ENS and um, continued on as a delegate even though he was fired from uh, the True Names entity, uh, the, the labs team. So this is an example of a kind of incoherent um, adjudication of an issue because of the conflict between the normative expectations and the, what the protocol mechanisms allowed for. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have Curve. Oh, yeah, on the other end of the spectrum, we have Curve, um, which is a yield protocol that uh, basically distributes rewards based on how long users have staked their tokens in the protocol. And uh, users can vote with staked tokens um, to allocate, allocate protocol liquidity um, to different uh, yield sources. And um, now the Convex protocol is a protocol that was built to interoperate with Curve, and it boosts rewards by essentially creating secondary markets for votes. So they uh, will pay you to vote to direct liquidity. Uh, protocols can pay to, uh, you to direct liquidity towards their protocol, um, you know, increasing their TLV. Um, and the, the language that the community has adopted to explain this mechanism is vote buying and bribing, uh, which is effectively uh, what it is. And now he, here's a, a, a very different case of how norms and uh, markets and architecture interact that um, maybe you'll have more to say about. Uh, maybe we can just ask the people on the side to be a little bit quieter because it's a bit hard to hear up here. Um, so. Here we have two different cases, and, and we can kind of see that in, in the ENS case, there, there's something going wrong. In Curve, there's, there seems to be like more alignment going on, and so you know, this kind of like demonstrated to us that there's, uh, there's a design space here, and, and there's kind of an institutional failure on, on the ENS side. So like, can, we, can we actually get to the bottom of what's, what's happening? Um, so notably, ENS it has a governance system, you know, coin voting, whereas Curve does not. So really what Curve has done is kind of subtracted the, uh, this explicit governance mechanism in order to, uh, to really kind of explicitly um, uh, or, or, or to surface the fact that, you know, anything is permissible in the protocol. Um, so, um, we're not really defending either of these um, these architectures, but we we kind of want to know like how to judiciously um, incorporate uh, different regulatory regimes into protocol design. Um, and yeah, I mean we we, we want to really understand where norms conflict with these other forces, markets, and architecture. So an important. Um, you know, as a protocol designer, the, the, the kind of important thing to internalize here is that protocols legitimize what they permit. Um, again, in, in the ENS case, the architecture allowed for Brantley to swing the vote, and this was in conflict with the, the user base and the, um, the, the, the kind of nominal set of, of actors who are participating in the system. Um, and Curb has uh, kind of the opposite, where they've subtracted governance. Uh, notably, in the, um, in the case of Mango Markets, the, the, the Mango Markets hack, the, the hacker uh, kind of 
memorably uh, noted that his actions were a highly profitable trading strategy. Um, so in his eyes, you know, the, the protocol permitted these actions. Um, because protocols don't have the affordance of law, they, do, they don't have the ability to um, kind of individually address uh, all things in, uh, in the kind of knowable universe. They, they have to have very explicit, uh, addressable actors and resources that they are trying to control. Um, and they, they need to use their, their kind of limited set of incentives um, to, to do any kind of recovery of, of an accountability mechanism. Um, and, uh, you know, you can't sue a blockchain. Um, so uh, there's just a, a fundamental difference in what kind of institutional framework, uh, regulatory framework, you're able to create with blockchain than um, with a protocol. So, okay, now we kind of have the resources to talk about, like, what, what is the nature of, of the protocol? What kind of institution institutions are we building here? Um, so, protocols regulate via these three forces, markets, code, and norms. Um, they are much more minimal than a, uh, than a state or, um, you know, other institutional regimes that, uh, that have a kind of physical presence. Um, they are scoped to these kind of numerical addressable assets and behaviors. Um, and they legitimize by code. Um, uh, so kind of all in all, the, the regulatory capacity of these, these protocol institutions um, works primarily through this, um, uh, through defining an a priori, a priori set of behaviors that, that are permissible and very limited post facto recourse. So you, you, you need to be explicit about what is, what, a, what the protocol should do or shouldn't do. And uh, if you're trying to kind of reconcile um, behavior that is outside of the protocol after the fact, you're going to, to have a kind of crisis of legitimacy that you're, you're working with. So at this point, it should be pretty clear in light of uh, these uh, features or these affordances uh, that we've highlighted that, let me just go back and show them again a little bit, um, that whatever crypto institutions are or will be, they will not operate directly exactly like state-based uh, institutions. And so our question was, what is the future of uh, crypto institutions? And so we see three concurrent end games uh, for crypto as an institutional space or as a space where new types of uh, institutional environments can be created. And we see the signs of these uh, three parallel universes already happening uh, and we can see them like the one uh, uh, that might not be so desirable to a lot of us here is an environment of fully regulated crypto with total legal integration, permission, KYC interfaces, uh, CBDCs, uh, um, and yeah, that's probably not the world that we, a lot of us want to live in. Uh, another that is much closer to the original cypherpunk vision is a fully permissionless, ungovernable uh, world of uh, lawless anarchy, uh, which has inspired uh, a lot of the, I think, initial excitement uh, to engage uh, with these technologies, but it's also what, as we were mentioning before, allows for like uh, scams, uh, all kinds of bad behavior in the name of uh, code is law. And then we see another gray area of uh, self-regulated crypto. And we think uh, this is like a more perhaps a tenuous uh, kind of scenario, but we think this scenario deserves to exist. Uh, and so why self-regulation? Um, so yeah, as although the, um, uh, the, the world of total anarchy is the one we're most familiar with, um, we uh, have to admit that um, not all behaviors that protocols enable are actually desirable. You know, there's, there's scams, contributors burn out, there's governance attacks, uh, collusion, uh, breaches of justice that, um, as we've pointed out, can't really be adjudicated. Um, and 
the crypto community has um, largely, under the ethos of credible neutrality, kind of condoned uh, any of the behaviors that the protocol make possible. Um, that credible neutrality has given a kind of plausible deniability there. But in practice, it means that there have been very few efforts by our community to ensure the bad behavior is prevented. Um, so when we think about what self-regulation looks like, what we're talking about is basically leveraging code in markets and norms especially to manage risk for users and uh, also address more positive ecosystem issues that um, need to um, need to exist. Um, and, and by this, you know, we don't mean that there should be more DAO constitutions. Like, that's not a viable model. Um, it is more about you know, taking a position on the larger social issues facing, uh, facing the ecosystem. Yeah, so um, just zooming out, like, Protocol designers thus far, I, I think, take a, take a very kind of adversarial mindset to, um, you know, who their users are going to be and how the protocol is going to be utilized. And I, I think that's entirely valid. That is absolutely a, a lens that um, that one should be taking to protocol design. But uh, maybe have had less consideration of like, okay, well, if if we kind of assume good behavior, um, we assume all the actors in the system, or many of the actors in the system, are, are trying to uh, kind of positively influence the direction of, of this institution, like what is possible in that regime? Um, and this is really the, the, the kind of space of norms um, that, that we want to, to kind of draw out. And um, we think that there's two kind of early signs um, of uh, kind of normative protocols that, that have really enriched the, um, the Ethereum ecosystem in particular. One is uh, now the Nouns DAO funding Zach XBT. Um, so this Zach XBT is, has done kind of a he, he's kind of like a, a, a Gonzo regulator of uh, of the crypto ecosystem and called out bad behavior. And Protocol Guild, um, shout out to to Trent if he's in the audience here. We really think is a uh, incredible kind of positive influence um, uh, on the, the protocol itself. It really enriches the, the Ethereum community in particular. And so what's really interesting about these two examples is that there are two really good instances uh, of uh, using on-chain mechanisms uh, to allocate capital in a way that directly reinforces the normative commitments uh, of these initiatives uh, towards the pro-social goals of improving the ecosystem at large. Yeah, and, and maybe the last thing to say about this is like, as foundations, as core teams, as protocol designers, like we are centralized actors in the ecosystem, and the roles that we have to play in um, creating these self-regulation don't just ex uh, aren't limited to funding, but also um, thinking about using the interfaces uh, that we're building as like part of the ecosystem, not necessarily as a censorship, um, but as um, uh, as self-regulation in in the way that ENS might prevent people from registering like hateful slurs as domain names through their actual front-end UI, um, even if it's still permitted through the protocol. And um, yeah, through education and rhetoric as well, what Zach XBT is doing is making information um, known so that people, teams, people, interfaces can choose whether to engage with a suspicious token or not. Um, yeah, so we really see this as, as existential to the future of crypto, kind of understanding institutions and, um, and understanding how we can actually keep, create these self-regulatory structures. So uh, I think a lot of the kind of DAO rhetoric has really collapsed in on itself. Um, we, we've really, there's really kind of a crisis of, of not having users. Um, and the ecosystem, the space has a, a kind of has its back against the wall. Um, so the survival of a cypherpunk vision of law-resistant institutions may counterintuitively depend on self-regulation. Um, and self-regulation requires institutional frameworks beyond smart contracts, 
beyond incentives, there needs to be more here. Um, and we think that, uh, yeah, kind of careful use of norms and kind of integration of these, these three remaining forces is, uh, is really critical to um, creating a kind of cogent self-regulatory regime within crypto. Thank you. That's it.